going to ask you again. Are you ready for the word this morning? Yes. Praise God. I'll tell you what, if we don't get excited about the portion of scripture that we're studying and reading now, you're never going to get excited. Because we are, are reading about the culmination of, of God completing his plan for all humanity, for this world, for this earth, for all people. See, the Bible gives us the wisdom and the knowledge to know what is true and to know what's coming. Now, the, the deciding factor on whether you believe it or not is you. Because faith is a willful, intentional decision to believe. It's not intellectual knowledge or understanding. It's not something cultivated and worked up. It's a decision. Either you believe or you do not believe. That's your choice. And the only way you can receive the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is by faith. There's no other way. So what I'm going to share with you in the scriptures over the next 45 minutes or so is either going to increase your faith, give you joy and peace and and, and you're going to walk out of here floating because of who our God is and what he says he's going to do for those who know him and love him. Or if you choose not to believe it by faith, you may walk out more confused than when you came in because it's a choice. God always gives free will. He loved us that much that he gives us the ability to choose what we believe, and he doesn't force us to believe. Now, that's what true love is, right? God gives you the choice. He loved us enough to send his son, as we heard several times already, Jesus, to die for our sins. And he gave us the keys to the kingdom. But to receive the kingdom, it can only be done by faith. Amen? Amen? So... We're going to cover a lot of ground today. I know I give you a lot of information when I do these messages. I haven't been giving out notes because it's just too much. But what I'm going to give you is some references. So if you want to write this down or jot it down or type it in your phone, you can. I use several different resources when I study and bring my messages together. Two that I use that are very reliable when it comes to expository preaching and teaching is Enduring Word. That's one commentary, Enduring Word. And the other is Verse by Verse Ministry. And these are teaching ministries that give you the word, line by line, precept by precept, and they teach you the Bible. And there's many other commentaries and resources, and, and I use a lot of them when I'm formulating my messages. But those are two good ones that I'd like to give to you. And, and the notes and what I'm preaching on, you could find in those commentaries so you could do your own study and follow up so that the word becomes more alive in your heart because faith comes by and hearing the word of God. You know, I say this all the time, but I'm going to keep saying it until you get it. I'm not here to give you popular opinion. I'm here to teach you truth. Because the truth is the only thing that can set you free in your head and in your heart. So when we make that decision to live by faith and become disciples, students of the Bible, then our thinking changes. Then our thought life changes. Then our attitude and our behaviors change. And then we can walk in the peace and the joy of the Lord as our strength. And that's how God called us to live. Not victims, but victors. Amen? I don't care what's going on in this world. You're not a victim. Because Jesus conquered sin and death on the cross. He's given us eternal life. We are victors in Christ. And when you have a victor mindset, you're happy. You're not walking around miserable. You're not filled with fear and anger and confusion because those things are worldly things. They're temporal things. We receive the word as eternal truth. Amen? All right, let's get ready to roll here. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to read from the, I'm going to read from the Amplified Version to start. And again, I'm reading, reflecting, and responding. So I'm just going to read the five verses that we're studying today. But these five verses are going to be unpacked in many Old Testament teachings and prophecies. Because to receive the full revelation of God, you got to know the whole scripture. Because everything that was written in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament was to be fulfilled in and through the New Covenant and the New Testament. And it's a learning curve and it's a learning process and it takes time. And God's patient. So be patient with yourself. 
But let's go along this ride together and learn and get our faith stronger. Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11, I'm reading from the Amplified Version. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who is riding it is called Faithful and True, Trustworthy, Loyal, Incorruptible, Steady. And in righteousness he judges and wages war on the rebellious nations. This, of course, is Christ. Verse 12, his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many royal crowns. And he has a name inscribed on him, which no one knows or understands except himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. Verse 14, and the armies of heaven dressed in fine linen, dazzling, White and clean followed him on white horses. Who is that army? We've been studying this. We read it last week in the beginning of chapter 19. We are that army. We are the one clothed in white robes of righteousness. We, the believers, who are with Jesus in heaven before he comes back to this earth. It's so important that we understand this, and I'm going to expound on it more. But remember, at this point in the tribulation, where we are in Revelation, the saints were already raptured, caught up to be with the Lord. And those who were dead in Christ rose first, and the rest were caught up in the air. And we went to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We read that last week. There's going to be a great feast and a banquet. There's the Bema seat judgment of Christ, where God is going to reward us for what we've done this side of heaven. What we did that was good, we're going to be rewarded for. And what we did that we shouldn't have, what we didn't do that we should have done would be burnt up. That's the works that bear no fruit. But all of us have access because of Christ alone. And there's going to be a great banquet, a great feast in heaven. And we are going to rejoice with Christ, getting ready with him to come back to this earth and rule and reign for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ. So guess what? You don't have to worry about global warming, do you? There's going to be a global warming in this end period of time. The earth is going to go through some tremendous persecution and tribulation because God is going to destroy most of it and then rebuild it. All to complete what he says needs to be done because the wrath of God must judge all sin. God is holy. And we're seeing that as we study this. So, let me get back to the word. Verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, which is his word, with which he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty in judgment of the rebellious world. As I've said before, people don't get away with nothing. We hear all these things. Why do, why do bad people get away with everything and good people die young and all this stuff? Guess what? If you're in Christ, you go to be with the Lord. You get a promotion when you die. So we get a promotion when we die if we're in Christ. Think like that. Change your thinking. Okay? Now we heard about a story of healing with Pastor Desmond. I've traveled all over the world preaching the gospel. God has given me the privilege to go to all different countries. I've seen some miraculous healings take place right before my eyes. But that's not the norm. It's not the norm. Does God heal supernaturally? Can God heal supernaturally? Yes. Does he always do it that way? No. It's his will, his way, his time. God's not a genie that we tell him what to do and decree and declare to God what needs to be done, and then when it don't happen, we're left disillusioned. That's bad teaching. We ask in faith, we believe in faith, and we trust God for the results, knowing that if he calls us home, we got promoted. See, this validates and justifies suffering on this earth for a season. You know, so many wicked things happen on this earth, and there's evil people. Let's just be honest. With all the things with child trafficking and all these wicked things that happen, and sometimes it makes people question, like, God, why? Where are you in this? How come you didn't rescue all these kids? We have these questions that we don't fully comprehend this side of heaven, but here's what we do have the answers for. Absence from this body is presence with God. And in heaven, there's no sickness, no suffering, no pain, no more death. Fix your thoughts on things above, not things below. That's what we have to think and believe as Christians. Back to the word. Verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed, 
King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, that's a great story of what's going to happen, but there's, there's so much more that takes place before Christ comes back. And that's what I'm going to unpack with you in the scriptures because we need to understand the full scope of things in and through the book of Revelation. And that's why we study. And that's why we have the word. Because Old Testament prophecy has a lot to do with the fulfillment of things that have to take place before Jesus actually comes back. So, over the last several weeks, we've talked about the bold judgments of God, right? I'm going to mention them briefly, just to give you a little recap. In the beginning was the plagues, the sores, the sea of blood, the river of blood, the burning sun, the painful dark. They were the the first five bold judgments, plagues. Then we saw the Euphrates River dry up, And we know that God did that strategically so that the end time war that Satan and his troops through the Antichrist would come through the valley of Jezreel and cross over the Euphrates River, which was dried up, to put their final assault on Israel because the devil and the Antichrist want to take over that promised land that's God's and God's people's. So the Euphrates River dried up. In the sixth bowl judgment, in the seventh one, the great city was destroyed. We talked about this, that Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, is going to be reestablished, and the Antichrist is going to have his headquarters there. And that's because where that is, geographically, is where everything started from the beginning, where the, where the Garden of Eden was. Everything took place in that region of the world. So it, as it started there, guess what? It's going to end there. And we also learned over the last several weeks that the armies of the north are going to come while the Antichrist is taking his troops to invade upon Israel, and they're going to attack and destroy his headquarters in Babylon. And God has strategically instructed that too because some of the kings defect from the Antichrist. And at this time, the world is under great siege because all of the plagues and the judgments have been taking place. There's been earthquakes and famines and tsunamis. The world is basically being leveled through this final part of the tribulation period. I know we've seen movies on it and seen certain things that can give us a little bit of a taste of what that's going to look like, but we really can't comprehend it because this earth and this world has never been through what's going to happen at the end of this time period. Basically, everything in the world is going to be destroyed except that portion of land where this end time army takes place before Christ returns so God can renew it and restore this earth. So there's a lot that needs to happen before Jesus comes back, even though we read it in those five verses. So in in chapter 19, as we go through the second part, from 11 to 16, we see Christ's return. The saints are with him in heaven. There's a great party, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're ready to return with Jesus. He's the one on the white horse. He's the one who's faithful and true. But before that happens, the phases of Armageddon need to continue to take place. So far, we've looked at phase one, phase two, and in in this part of the chapter, we're going to see phases three through five in the battle of Armageddon. And I've walked you through that the last several weeks, how the armies of the north are going to come as the Antichrist and his troops march towards Jerusalem through the Jezreel Valley by the way of the dried up Euphrates River. They're going to attack Jerusalem. And while they're doing that, the armies of the north are coming. So all of this last end time battle is cultivating and culminating all to center on Jerusalem, God's chosen land, God's promised land, and God's chosen people. So there's stages of this battle. There's stages of the battle. Now, what I'm going to do, what we have to unpack a little bit here to fully understand what's going to happen, we have to go back and look at Old Testament prophecy and Scripture. So we're going to go back to the book of Daniel, and I'm going to read to you one verse in Daniel, Daniel 9.24. And this verse is prophetic. It refers to the second coming of Christ. And there's six points in this verse that are really important to understand when it comes to unpacking prophecy and what's going to happen. So I want you to visualize this in your mind. Daniel was written thousands of years before this is going to happen. God's word is eternal. There's no time limit on it. The prophetic word of Daniel was written. So follow with me, Daniel 9.24. I'm going to be reading it from the New King James Version. It says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. That's the tribulation period. 70 weeks. To finish the transgression, that's the first reason why, finish the transgression, 
to make an end of sin. God's going to eliminate sin. That's the second reason. To make atonement for iniquity since the first covenant that the Jews had with the Lord, the Mosaic covenant, there had to be a blood sacrifice for sin. If you know anything about the Jewish faith and culture, guess what? There's no blood sacrifices for sin right now. There's no atonement. Without the shedding of blood, it says there's no remission of sin. So their covenant has been void because there's no blood sacrifice. Only the ones who accepted Jesus as Messiah received the atoning sacrifice, and they came out of the old covenant, and they were put in the new covenant, because Jesus came first for the Jew, and then the Gentile. Are you following me? Raise your hand if you're following me. It's important that you're following what I'm saying here. So the sacrificial system ended when Jesus came and shed his blood on the cross for all sin. He came first for the Jew, his chosen people, to fulfill the covenants of old. The Abrahamic covenant, the, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, he came to fulfill these covenants with his own blood, God's son, Jesus. Israel rejected him as their Messiah. Only a remnant received him. That remnant is protected, and they're grafted. They are part of the new covenant, sealed with the blood of Christ. The other Jews who are under the first covenant, God has to judge that covenant and bring it to completion before he restores all people. See, God don't leave anything open-ended. When God makes a covenant with a nation, with a people, it's eternal. They might not keep their end of the bargain, but guess what? God's going to keep his end of the bargain. So I want you to understand this. So I'm going to read it again. The six points here. To finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness. Once this happens, there's going to be an everlasting righteousness. And to seal up a vision and a prophecy to anoint the most holy place. This is God's plan throughout the ages. It was written way back in the book of Daniel. This must be completed and accomplished before the second coming. There's another Old Testament prophet. His name was Zechariah. He also talks about the second coming during the end of the tribulation. Zechariah chapter 13, if you want to follow me, I'm going to look at verses 8 and 9. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Now, most of Israel rejected Christ. And because of that, the judgments of God and the curses have been upon the Jewish people throughout the centuries. But at this end time, there's going to be a resurgence. The people that are left, because a lot of them are going to die in this battle. We're going to see that as we go. The ones that remain and call upon the Lord, they're truly going to be saved. And that covenant is going to be fulfilled once God's judgment and wrath takes place. Now, God is a God of mercy and grace, but he's also a God of judgment. That's why Jesus, his son, had to die on the cross. He took our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. So God has mercy and grace, but God also pours out his wrath and judges unrighteousness and sin. And that's what's happening in this end time tribulation period. Are you following me? Say amen. So Zechariah 13, 9, and I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Then they will call upon my name. Then they're going to call out to God. And that's what God is waiting for, his chosen people, the ones who rejected his son, Jesus Christ. In the end, when all this calamity comes, they're going to call on him. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? You will not see me again until you cry. Didn't Jesus say that? Well, this is the part where they cry. Second coming. More Old Testament scripture. We're studying this in Bible study. We're not there yet. But Deuteronomy chapter 29, if you want to turn there. More Old Testament revelation and prophecy, which explains what's happening during this end time tribulation. Deuteronomy 29, starting in verse 14. I'm going to read through verse 18. Deuteronomy 29, 14 through 18. 
Now, not with you alone, I am making this covenant and this oath, but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. So this covenant is not just for the people who were alive when Moses was speaking it. It was for the nation of Israel as a whole, for all the generations. Verse 16. For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. Moreover, you have seen their abominations and their idols of wood, stone, silver, and gold, which they had had with them. Verse 18. So that there will not be among you a man or a woman, a family or tribe, whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. That there will not be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit or wormwood. What does that mean? National repentance has to come for Jesus to come back. They have to personally repent to accept Christ just like we do. God came first for the Jew. So the Jews in the end times, when all this stuff is happening, those that are alive in Israel, those that remain, the remnant's going to be hidden, but those that are not saved are going to cry out to God in desperation, and they're going to repent of their sin and denying the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They're going to repent individually, and they're going to repent corporately as a nation. That's where we get the scripture that we all like to pray and share in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. That's the premise of this, the nation repenting. And then God forgives their sin and heal their land. Well, guess what? In this end time revelation, all of Israel is going to repent, those who are alive, and guess what's going to happen? God's going to save and restore all of Israel. We're going to see that as we continue to read. Jumping back to the New Testament, Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. If you want to get there, I'll give you a moment. Romans 7, 4 through 6. This also refers to the second coming. Who wrote the book of Romans? The apostle Paul, the former Pharisee Saul, who became the apostle of God. Romans 7, 4 says this, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to it, by which we were bound, so that we can serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He was talking first to the Jews, saying that Christ fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the old covenant with his blood. They were no longer bound to the letter of the law, but they couldn't keep it anyway. How many of us know you can't keep all the law because we have flesh? We can't keep all the law. The law was given to us as a mirror to show our guilt and our need and dependence upon God. Jesus came to conquer sin and death and give us a new covenant, a better covenant. And Paul's talking about his own people here saying that when they come to faith in Christ, they're no longer bound to the letter of the law. But if they don't come to faith in Christ, guess what? They're still bound under the old covenant. But that's the, God, that's the covenant God made with Israel. Are you following me? Say amen. amen. This is good stuff, isn't it? Let's continue. Back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 29, 22 through 25. Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled as we're studying Revelation. Deuteronomy 29, 22. Now the generation to come, your sons who rise up after you, And the foreigner who comes from the distant land, when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases which the Lord has afflicted it, will say, all its land and its brimstone and salt and burning waste, unsown, unproductive, no grass grows in it, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done this to this land? Why? this great outburst of anger. Then men will say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
Judgment comes to the people. God brings everything to fruition in the end of days. And he has to judge the Jewish people by the covenant he made with them, the old covenant. So this stuff has to happen. It has to take place. Back to the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul. Again, Paul was a Jew and a Pharisee, so he knew the law. He knew what had to happen before Jesus comes back. So let's look at Romans chapter 11, verses starting in verse 7. I'm going to jump around in a few verses, but we're going to start in Romans 11, 7. It says this, What then was what Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. So what does that mean? Only a remnant of Jews accepted Christ when he came the first time. And the Bible says the rest of them were hardened until the fulfillment of the Gentiles. What does that mean? It means that the gospel of Jesus Christ was not just for the Jew, but a Gentile is everyone who's not a Jew. And the good news was to go to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And when the word goes to every tribe, every tongue, every nation, at the end, God's going to come and deal with his own people and restore them. Romans 11, verse 11. But I say them, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgressions, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. That God had a plan from the very beginning. Luke chapter 13, verse 34. I know I'm jumping around a lot because all of these scriptures correlate for what is taking place during this season. Luke 13, 34 says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Verse 35, Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's when Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. When he said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And they said, how are you going to rebuild this temple in three days? It took 40 years to build. They didn't understand what he was talking about. He meant he was the temple. And because they rejected him, he would be resurrected in three days. And then they would not be able to see him again until they cried and wept in repentance. See, everything had to come full circle. The Jews had to come through faith in Christ alone, through repentance, just like we do. Are you following me? I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture, but there's a a rhyme and a reason for this, and we're going somewhere. Back to the Old Covenant, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40 through 42. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I was also acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled, so that then they will make amends for their iniquity. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will also remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well, And I will remember the land. What is God waiting to happen for the Jews? He's waiting for them to repent. And all of this, their hearts are so hard. All of this part of the tribulation is twofold. It is to cleanse the world from sin and unrighteousness. And it's also to bring God's chosen people back to right standing with him. Through repentance and faith in his son. And how do we know that? Back to Romans. Two verses. Romans 11, 25, and 26. Romans 11, 25, and 26. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed about this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So you see, the Bible is teaching us that God does things completely. He leaves nothing open-ended. 
No one gets away with nothing. I'm going to give you some practical terminology. Because I know I'm giving you a lot of Bible verses. No one gets away with nothing. God judges everything. God is a just judge and a righteous judge. We look at the world and we see evil and we see all this stuff and we get frustrated and angry and, and a lot of times we lash out or act out because we think there's so much injustice. God is allowing injustice in this world for a time and a season. He has a purpose so that the gospel can go to all the earth so that people have a choice to call upon the name of his son and truly get born again and saved and cross over from death to life spiritually and inherit eternal life and be delivered from all kinds of evil. God is merciful and graceful in allowing this world to go through this time until he says enough. And then when he says enough, it's enough. I hope this is answering some of the questions in your brain about why evil things happen and why there's so much chaos and why the children die young and why is there sickness and death. God has a greater purpose than just the here and now. I want to remind you, absence of this body is presence with the Lord. Back to the New Testament. Matthew 24, 13. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, we would know the signs of the times. That in the end times, we would see signs. Matthew 24, 13 says this. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. That goes for us too. You know what? Tribulation comes, hardship comes, difficulties come. God gives us the Holy Spirit to give us the strength to endure and persevere. Great trials, testings, sufferings, and hardships. God never leaves us nor forsakes us. He gives us power, his spirit, to indwell us, to lead us and guide us into all truth, to make us overcomers more than conquerors in Christ. God empowers us with his spirit. Matthew 24, 14 this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end shall come. So why is it getting dark? Why does it have to get darker? There's only one reason. But the gospel has to go to every tongue, every tribe, every nation. God wants all to be saved, none to be lost. Do you believe that today? That's the reason why God is allowing this to happen. It's because he's a God of mercy and grace. Luke chapter 18, verse 27. But he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. What's impossible for man is possible with God. This is why faith is a decision to believe in what God's word says is true. You're not going to intellectually rationalize it and figure it out in your brain. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you're going to choose to either believe all of it or none of it. But you can't believe some of it and not all of it because not, God is not a man that he should lie. Either the word of God is true, every single word of it, or it's nonsense, throw it in the garbage. Either Jesus Christ is the son of God who existed before he became flesh and created the heavens and the earth and became flesh and died and rose again, or he didn't. It's either nonsense or truth. Every human being has a decision to make along their personal journey and quest, whether or not they're going to receive the call of God through the gospel, the good news. Do I believe that Jesus Christ came to seek and save that which was lost? Did Jesus Christ come to deliver us from our sins and deliver us from all evil and give us a kingdom that has no end? We all have to make that decision sometime in our life. And the Bible says that if the soil of your heart is right, when you hear the word, it'll bear root and it will grow. If the soil of your heart is not right, it'll bounce off. And I believe this. As the word is preached, as the word is given, it's like an ax to the root. And every time you hear the word, God's chipping away at that icy heart, that stony heart, that hardened heart. All those issues in life, all those things that cause us to doubt, to not have faith, to deny God, to be angry and bitter. Jesus Christ came with an atmosphere of love, and he puts that love in us, those of us who truly know him and call upon him. And it is the love of God that is more powerful than anything else. The Bible says true love casts out and drives out all fear. Love conquers all. Love is the greatest gift. And the greatest demonstration of love that was ever given was God giving his own son to die for you and me. Would you give your son or daughter to die for somebody else? 
Think about that. That was the cost. God did it because he loved you and he loved me. And God's allowing all this to happen on the earth, but he's waiting for people to call upon his name. He's waiting for those to receive the gift of salvation. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Praise God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Everybody is going to receive their just due when Christ comes back to rule and reign on this earth. Do you understand that? I'm going to say it again. No one's getting away with anything. There's one just judge between God and man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Matthew 24, 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So let me tell you what's going to happen. As God is setting up the failure of the Antichrist and the false prophet, as they are pursuing Jerusalem, they will have some power to cause some damage and harm among the Israeli people. There will be wars and fighting before Jesus comes. And these things have to happen for God to bring the people to a true place of repentance and calling out on the name of God. I want to read verse 30 again because I want you to understand the No, actually 29 and 30. I want you to understand the significance of this. But immediately after the tribulation in those days, after the tribulation, after the battle, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. There's going to be complete darkness, darkness, utter darkness upon the whole earth. And then, verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Hallelujah. Picture that event that's going to take place. God is going to stop everything. Everything's going to be brought to nothing for a moment, and then all of a sudden the heavens are going to open up, and there's Jesus on a white horse with all of his saints and the angels of heaven, us being a part of that, to come back to this earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. That is the future glory of the church of Jesus Christ. That is what the Bible says will happen upon this earth. As it is written, so be it. That is the word of the Lord. Believe it or not, your choice. To further confirm what Matthew said in the book of Zechariah, Old Testament prophet, verses 14, chapter 14, verses 6 and 7 says this, In that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about in that evening time there will be light. God is light. In him there is no darkness there is no deviation. There is no shifting shadows. Now let me just cover a few things a little bit more clearly for you. As the Antichrist is pursuing Jerusalem, as he's waging war against the saints of God, as he's causing some destruction on, on the Jewish people, those who are not regenerated, those who are not born again, during the tribulation, as we've studied in the past, that people will get saved during that time. Some will be killed for their faith. Others, the Jews, are going to run and hide in Basroth, which is modern-day Petra. And they will be hiding in the rocks. The Bible talks about this in, in Scripture. 
And the Antichrist will pursue the Jews in Jerusalem and he'll pursue the Jews in Petra because he knows they're going to be there. But God is not going to allow him to destroy all of them because they're going to get help from God's angel armies. And they're going to come to a place of brokenness and surrender. And when they see Jesus Christ in all his glory and splendor, they're going to repent and cry out and mourn and weep. Why? But they're going to realize they rejected the Messiah the first time he came. Amen. Do you understand how everything needs to come to fruition? They're going to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. And they rejected him. But when they see him in all his glory, as they thought he was going to come the first time as a conquering king to establish his kingdom on the earth, the first time he came not as a conquering king, but a servant, a lamb, to shed his blood for the sins of humanity. But when he comes back a second time, the Bible alludes to, and Paul says this in Romans 11, all of Israel shall be saved. What does that mean? The remaining ones that are on the earth at the end of this tribulation period where most of the earth is utterly destroyed and wrecked. During this end time battle, there will be a remnant of Israel because God made a covenant promise with them and if they kept their covenant, God would keep them. And at the end when they cry out and see Jesus and truly repent, they're saved. This is what's happening. This is what's going to happen. You're not going to read that in a history book. You're going to read it in the Bible. This is why our faith is not blind. This is why our faith is not we're, 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 we're holding on to hoping for something because Jesus died for us. No, the Bible gives us clear instruction to why God does things and why this world has been separated from God because of sin and what needs to take place for the wrath of God to judge all sin, for God to keep his covenants that he made with the Israeli people, for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to fulfill those covenants, that law, by his shed blood on Calvary so all can be saved, so that the heavens and the earth can be renewed, a new heaven and a new earth. Old things are passing away and all things are becoming new. That's enough for today. I, th I think that's enough. Worship team, you could come forward. I get so excited I could run up and down the aisle, but I'm not going to do that. That would be in my flesh, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> Are you getting a hold of this? Are you understanding why our, our faith, we need to hold on to it and, and seek God with all of our... What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment, right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, that's the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. That's what the Israelites hold on to. And what's the second greatest commandment that Jesus brought? Love your neighbor as yourself. See, when you receive the love of the Father, the mercy of the Father, the forgiveness and grace of the Father, then you're able to extend it because your eyes have been opened and you're no longer seeing through a world view or a world system. You're seeing in the Spirit. God's given you His heart, the Father's heart. God's given you His eyes and His ears to receive truth so that you can be that vessel for God. You can walk in that freedom that God says you have in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. You're saved by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. I hope that answers some of the skeptics. I hope that answers some of you who are maybe have not made that profession of faith in Jesus Christ, but you had too many why questions. You had too many variables that didn't make sense to you. I hope that the word cut like a sword and pierced your heart today. Because that's what the word of God does. And when the word pierces and brings conviction, it leads to repentance, and repentance leads to change, and change leads to salvation. Praise God. So I want you to think about everything you heard today. Go home, get along with God. And if you haven't given your heart to Jesus Christ, if you haven't truly repented and called upon him, do that by yourself. And God will come to you. 
and streams of living water will flow in and through you. And the peace and the grace and the mercy of God will begin his work in your life. And he'll heal that stony heart. He'll heal those past offenses and sins and weights. And he'll deliver you from all kinds of evil. That's the God we serve. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Father, I just thank you for this time with my brothers and sisters. I thank you for your word that is a sword. It is a double-edged sword. It pierces, it cuts, it divides. It removes all the cancer, all the bitterness, all the anger. It does surgery on our hearts. And then it heals and restores and reconciles. Oh, Father, we're so grateful for your word and your Holy Spirit. We're so grateful for your love because the motivation for all of it is love. You loved us first, Father, so much. You sent your son to die for us. You've forgiven us for all our offenses if we'll believe in your son and call upon him. And you've delivering us from all kinds of evil. You're giving us a new heart and a new life in and through the Holy Spirit and the word. Father, bless my brothers and sisters. May your word go deep in their heart. Do the surgery that needs to be done in some. Bring the joy and peace in others. Heal and restore what's been stolen, lost, and broken off by the devil and by the lies of the enemy. Father, I pray this in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.